uh, <coughs> titled Selecting the Right Learning Technologies for Your Organization. I'm Jack Lee. I'm president and CEO of KMSI, and here with me today is Mr. Mike Benix, our chief technology officer, and we're going to be uh, doubling up here covering this information. If you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please go ahead and uh, go ahead and ask. We're going to go ahead and start recording uh, uh, this, so anything from here on out will be in the replay. If you do want to be unmuted, uh, that's fine. Just uh, let us know in the chat room. There's a little box there at the bottom that should say "Send Message to Public Chat," where you can, uh, you know, send a message in, and uh, AJ or Carrick uh, can unmute you and uh, uh, get you going. Uh, again, today's event is being recorded, and uh, the replay will be available probably sometime uh, tomorrow, uh, assuming everything goes smoothly and we don't have any power outages like the last, uh, like our last event. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, that aside, uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. AJ, did you have anything you wanted to say before we get rolling? Nope. Just uh, thank you all for attending, and I look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. Okay. Let's go ahead and move this along. Okay, so one of the first things we want to talk about today is uh, addressing the current situation that a client might be in versus what they would consider the optimum situation. And one of the, the things that gets forgotten frequently is trying to involve all the stakeholders in the decision-making process or even knowing who those stakeholders actually are uh, or should be, uh, depending on the organization. Now, uh, we go to an awful lot of trade shows and uh, uh, different events where we're talking to HR executives, training managers, uh, and the like. And one of the you know constant things we hear uh, you know out at these shows is you know they really need to reach more people. Uh, they need to you know get beyond corporate. They need to get out you know into the franchises, the field, uh, the, the the actual employees that are actually building or servicing or providing the company's products or services. Uh, they also need to support their instructors, supervisors, managers. Uh, and executives and uh, trying to figure out what the supported roles are. And I know Mike's going to talk a little bit about this later. It was very important in trying to figure out what kind of technology that you're going to use to solve that problem. Now, the other thing that you need to you know, consider in this is how do we identify the contributors, the people that are actually feeding the beast? Uh, you know, is it just HR? Do we have uh, developers? Uh, are those developers part of operations? Are they you know, part of corporate? Uh, where do the instructors reside? You know, you know how is their schedule uh, determined? What do they need to have not only to contribute to the success of the program, but to be successful themselves? Uh, your subject matter experts, where where do they reside? Is operational or uh, you know uh, employee you know qualification training part of the program, or are you trying to do something you know that's uh, you know more along the lines of a, uh, an HR qualification program? Do you need IT support in order to integrate any technologies to work with the cloud? Uh, these are, uh, again, some things I know Mike is going to touch on later. Uh, and then, you know, last but not least, you know, where are the facilities and who owns the facilities? What is the, the, the systems, equipment, uh, technology, uh, workspaces, et cetera, that are going to be needed to, you know, uh, make the program successful? And, and, you know, identifying those contributor roles in each of these functions is pretty important to having that optimum successful acquisition uh, of technology. So one of the processes that we've looked at with clients time and again is uh, what's called the SWOT analysis. It stands for strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat analysis. I like to call it strength, weakness, opportunity, uh, and risk, but that came out swore, so we went back to SWOT. Uh, and so uh, the SWOT analysis gives you a method to, to put things in buckets. You know, what are our strengths? You know, what are the weaknesses? And not just the weaknesses of our technology, but the weaknesses of our organization. Where could we bolster things up? Where could we provide some relief to our senior managers, our, you know, uh, our supervisors, you know, in terms of having to provide on-the-job training? Uh, you, know, where, uh, you know, where are we having problems operationally? Uh, either corporate or in the field or at our franchises, uh, or maybe it's our customer support or our customers themselves that need, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, support. And what's the risk of not doing it, okay? Uh, you know, if, if we don't take the steps necessary to get to the optimum situation, you know, what, what are the risks? 
Uh, and that really gives you, you know, the range of opportunities that you could implement in order to get to your optimum solution. Now, some things are going to be required. You know, you're going to have to have some basic components in order to have a good, you know, learning, you know, technology program within your organization. Uh, you know, most companies are going to have to have at least one LMS, although, uh, you know, maybe one LMS isn't the optimal solution. Maybe you need you know, an LMS for function A and an LMS for function B. We see that quite frequently out there. Uh, and so, you know, these are the kind of things that you need to, you know, con concern yourself with when you're looking at what the required, uh, uh, you know, elements are. But then you're going to have optional requirements, things that, you know, are, are the nice to have that fill in that opportunities section of your SWOT analysis, things that, you know, can, can move you forward, reduce the risk, uh, take advantage of your strengths and fill in your weaknesses. And those will give you your best, uh, you know, uh, ROI if you can go ahead and assign some kind of weight to them. You know, what, uh, what's the importance of them? What's the potential return on investment of implementing that, that technology or that function, you know, in our procurement uh, or technology acquisition process? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things that he's had to deal with from a technology standpoint and in supporting our customers, uh, you know, in implementing these large scale systems. And we've done some of the largest in the world. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, that will come in useful here for you uh, as we move forward. Mike. Thank you, Jack. Uh, as Jack said, one of that, that that upfront analysis, that SWOT analysis, is going to identify, among other things, where are your what are your key friction points uh, going to be among your requirements. Um, right, where are your points of integration? What what information do you need to share between your learning platform, your HR systems, uh, possibly other platforms where learning may be taking place that you want to want to get information back to uh, your new LMS that that activities are going on. Uh, you need to identify all these points of integration and communication um, to uh, uh, to do it, and uh, you'd be surprised how many there can be. Uh, everything from from common authentication technologies with your with your web portals to uh, uh, hard information exchange between systems for uh, uh, defining uh, training requirements and reporting uh, training accomplishment. Um, We've had customers go so far in integrating with the uh, LMS as to, uh, to check the LMS every time before they access a particular system that their training is current to allow them to use it, right? And imagine a large uh, uh, SAP implementation and uh, part of your single sign-on process is to check that, that you've completed the appropriate training modules before you get access to, to the relevant modules in SAP. Uh, we've, we've supported that kind of thing and uh, uh, your, your training all of a sudden becomes a gatekeeper uh, for uh, access to make sure that people are trained to do the job they're about to do. Um, your security requirements, um, that's a constantly moving target these days. Uh, you know, in an era when, when uh, uh, IT security can, uh, can literally, you know, cause the lights to go out or the uh, fuel to stop flowing, uh, your training system has got to be integrated tightly in with your uh, the rest of your infrastructure uh, security uh, environment and uh, not uh, not open up any holes in it, right? It can't be a, a point of access that creates uh, uh, access points, new access points or new surface area of attack, uh, as well as protecting the sensitive information that it hosts about who your people are and what, the, what training they've completed. Uh, audience availability. Uh, can your people get to it, right? Who am I training and can they reach the system? And that means uh, even getting down to in some cases, some infrastructure analysis of uh, where are they accessing the service from? Do they have adequate bandwidth? If they're uh, constantly going to be, you know, if a sales force wants to be constantly accessing this training uh, over a, uh, you know, a tethered Wi-Fi device, a mobile device, or possibly even while traveling, uh, you need to know that you're producing material and delivering material in a way that's going to be bandwidth friendly for the kind of connection they're using. Uh, same thing can can work with a network of of partnerships that you don't necessarily control. Uh, imagine, if you will, the a, a, a dealer network that represents your product and sells your product. 
uh, and, and they're supporting hundreds or even thousands of points of presence around the country, what does that network connectivity look like? And do you have a, a model that's going to be uh, uh, bandwidth friendly and uh, has connectivity open to support them uh, in the way you need to do it? Uh, delegation of authority can be another big friction point. Can you delegate the tasks that you need to to the right folks so that you don't overburden a uh, or need, create a need to staff a large central training administration function? Uh, if managers can pull their own reports about how their people are doing at completing required training, uh, that's that's a customer service call that they're not making to the central group asking, you know, where how are my people doing, and uh, uh, where are they in their uh, in their continuum? Uh, high turnover environments that becomes incredibly important. Uh, where where managers, local managers, and supervisors need to be constantly on the ball with getting new hires through their onboarding training. Uh, that ability to delegate reporting and uh, oversight responsibility directly to that line manager as part of his job uh, is essential. You know you can't constantly afford to be going back and forth with a central uh, training staff. Cost of technology. If you're paying per headcount to use your technology, you're overpaying. It's that simple. And and those costs can quickly drive uh, certain technology uh, solutions right out of your right out of your budget, uh, or or they can become insidious and uh, add to year over year growth in your costs as as you try to reach ever bigger and bigger audiences. Um, uh, we've started more than one new customer relationship when they had a, a wonderful solution in place that dealt with uh, the needs of the uh, corporate office and uh, key constituencies in their, uh, whatever network they're using to reach their customers, be it their retail sales, um, uh, relationships with uh, key vendors or representatives. And then the next year they needed to, to expand that, you know, to additional staff within their dealer network or to, uh, a contract workforce that they've engaged to help with a certain uh, key business function. And all of a sudden your, your cost of technology explodes because you need another 10,000 seat licenses um, to, uh, to do it. So be wary about wary of that particular uh, uh, time bomb uh, or landmine in, embedded in your cost structure when you select your technology. Uh, KMX, uh, obviously I'm bringing this up because KMX does not charge a, uh, a per user seat license. And user scalability is also a huge issue. If you've got a 100,000 person audience to train, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to be prepared to train 100,000 people at a time, because if everybody's training, then nobody's doing any other work. Uh, but if your business cycles are such that you've got to train everybody annually, and that annual deadline is going to be the same across the business, well, guess what? You're going to train 100,000 people in a, in a two-month window approaching that annual deadline every year. Uh, and that means you might be training five to 10,000 people at a time during your busy, uh, uh, busy hours of the day uh, in the last couple of weeks as that deadline approaches and you need to be prepared for that. And your, your technology partner needs to be prepared uh, with both the infrastructure and an application that can scale to that large uh, function. And you need a system that's intuitive enough that end user support is, is not an issue. Right? If your audience has got a scale uh, and you've accounted for uh, cost of technology and scalability to reach that audience. And then all of a sudden, every third user trying to get in has got a question that they've got to reach out to a support desk for help. Uh, you're going to get skunked again, right? You're never going to keep up with that end user support. And uh, uh, that friction is going to kill you. So it's got to be intuitive enough that end user support is easy. And you've got to have the right partnerships and support function in place to, to handle the one-offs that do come up uh, uh, when they're out there. Jack, can you advance that slide for me? You're muted, Jack. I made you presenter. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. Let me uh, let me push the slide. Can you just go ahead? Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's at the bottom. Yep. There we go. Thank you. Uh, stakeholders. I touched on this just a second ago when I was talking about your scalability. Can you reach everybody? Uh, but your stakeholders can be a very large audience, right? It's not just your headquarters office workers who you're trying to, to teach soft skills to. Uh, you've got networks of uh, partners in most businesses that you need to reach. They can be agents reselling your product, key suppliers who are providing you uh, input technology to your uh, 
uh, manufacturing process. Uh, franchise uh, businesses have, you know, obviously huge stakeholder requirements within the franchise workforce. Um, and uh, dealerships may include both sales uh, and service and support personnel. So you need to know who that audience is. You may even be offering training to the customers who are buying your product uh, on how to come back and do that. So uh, uh, know your, your, your total audience and then go back through those areas of friction I just talked about on the previous slide and make sure every one of them can reach you, uh, that you haven't inadvertently created some barrier that they can't get to. Right? Does your, does your franchise network uh, have uh, adequate work terminals for people to access the training from within their uh, place of employment? Uh, does that network connectivity allow them in? Uh, if there are um, hourly uh, restrictions on, on non-exempt employees training outside of work hours and training from home, you not only need a way to allow them in from their place of work, you need a way to block them from trying to come in from home. Uh, you know, so your authentication model has to take that into account. So lots to consider in who your audience is, where they're going to be training from, and how you're going to reach them technically uh, to, uh, to let them in at the right time and only at the right time. Right. Can you support self-service? This is critical to keeping your customer service workload and your administrative workload down. The more you can delegate uh, from your central training function back to the people who really depend on a trained workforce to get their jobs done, the, the easier it is for those folks to uh, take care of their own needs, the less burdensome that central administration is going to be uh, and the less work you've got to do to, to plan and manage that. Supervisors and managers have got to be able to go in and pull reports on how their uh, staff is doing. That means the LMS needs to know who their staff are right? Who are their direct reports and what is their total span of control through, you know, possibly one or two extra layers of, of uh, managers and supervisors. Um, they need to be able to make training assignments on the fly in addition to whatever central rules you've set up. So that if an individual employee needs uh, specific uh, development needs, uh, they, they identify those needs and they can identify within your learning platform the the solution to those needs and get that individual paired up with what he what he requires. Uh, whether that's a, a rising star who they want to develop and groom for bigger things or whether that's an employee who's struggling in an area and needs some help uh, coming up to speed to meet expectations, uh, the management team should have the ability to go in and, and influence that training assignment. Uh, the training resources uh, should be uh, easy to use, easy to schedule, and uh, easy for uh, everybody to access. Right. Nothing can drive a, a central administration team nuts more than trying to manage schedules to physical classrooms. Right. If you can delegate that so that the individual instructors can help control that and you've got an army of, of 50 or 100 instructors, uh, each running run work out of a, a network of classrooms, the ability to manage those, cl those classroom schedules can become a choke point if, you, if you're not careful and don't plan for it. You've got to be able to delegate that uh, resource allocation out to the folks best equipped to do it efficiently uh, so that, that uh, central uh, support doesn't become a, a critical choke point uh, to, uh, to do that. A common fallback for implementing a lot of training solutions is to just grab the, uh, the bolt-on system being sold with your HRIS, right? All the big uh, HR and ERP implementation providers have a bolt-on LMS. Um, because it's, it's bundled with their package, they tend to, to fire up fast, right? If you've already stood up a particular ERP or HR system, uh, adding on their, their training module is usually pretty quick. Um, uh, <clears throat> you don't have a new contract to sign. You don't have a new um, uh, relationship to stand up. Uh, you may not even have new software to install. It may be a couple of administrative switches and, a, and, and pasting in a license key, and boom, it all turns on. Uh, so there can be, it can be very attractive, and they may be offering it at a very attractive price point. Uh, they may be teaching you in with, uh, you know, a lack of incremental cost to, uh, to get that training function uh, later on uh, to go with your HR function without any additional uh, or minimal additional costs. But they typically come with some very, 
significant restrictions or uh, missing capability that you need to be watching for. Um, they don't always reach all the stakeholders. Uh, they, they tease you with the, the no extra cost uh, as a starting point, uh, but then you bump into per headcount license fees that all of a sudden rear up that you hadn't anticipated because not everybody in the company needed a, a seat license for the HR system. And then all of a sudden now to be trained, they need a seat license. And what looked like a small incremental cost uh, was really hidden and becomes a very huge incremental cost um, to do it. Uh, uh, they uh, to do that. They can be very difficult to extend and customize uh, with uh, without a lot of great integration APIs or other uh, points of interaction, and uh, uh, so they don't uh, don't always play well in a, uh, a large complex IT infrastructure uh, with with sharing information. Um, and if you need to customize them, they can be very uh, brittle, very or very rigid, uh, with extremely high costs associated with even what seem like modest customizations to accommodate uh, unique sets of information about people or about the training delivered to uh, uh, to manage your program. So you got to dig deep into those systems and make sure they're really going to support you across the infrastructure needs, across the access needs, across the, the audience you're looking for before you uh, uh, before you jump onto that. Right. And, and I want to walk you through a, a, an example here of what uh, you know, how all these come together, all these different processes I've just talked about with your audience access, your uh, HR systems integration, your selection process can affect our, a real world training example, right? One challenge you'll, you'll immediately run into is that your HR and payroll classification schemes uh, mesh neatly with your uh, pay levels, uh, but they don't always mesh so neatly with what that person really does. Right. If I identify that John Smith is a service technician level one, that doesn't necessarily help his manager who has got 15 service level uh, one, service tech level one staff members, uh, and he's broken them up into uh, some of them becoming specialists in different subsystems. You know, John's going to become a brake specialist. Joe is going to become an exhaust uh, system specialist. Somebody else is going to work on transmissions. Uh, and somebody else is tuning up the powertrain. And, uh, you know, but yet in HR, they're all service technician level one or level two, right? How do I break out and, and assign them the training they need to do it? It's very hard to do if I'm limited to just identifying them by their payroll classification. You've got to have the flexibility to define the real job that they really do uh, and drive their training accordingly, right? Because in the, the brake specialist needs to get to uh, brakes, discs, drums, and pads, cylinders, and hydraulic control systems, and the electronics that, that uh, manage all that. Uh, the exhaust guy has got a whole different set of diagnostics and electronics he's got to get into. The transmission guy, same thing. Uh, very, very different subsystems. Uh, you may have a handful of people you want to have cross-trained across these specialties. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily represent everybody in the service bay uh, all the time. So you've got to be prepared to uh, drill into these and meet the needs of that line manager in the maintenance shop, in this case at a, at a, a dealer service center, to allocate his people and their training requirements correctly. Right? And if you allow yourself to get boxed in to an HR uh, payroll classification scheme that doesn't reflect his real operating world, You've got a mess on your hands, right? You know, he's going to be that the training manager is going to be dissatisfied with the with the service that the centralized training system is providing, because it doesn't really identify who he needs to get trained in what specialties to run a shop, right? And you could you could replicate these kinds of examples into large retail operations, uh, where you may have inventory specialists, and you've got to, you're constantly training uh, new folks to work the cash register, uh, and you're uh, uh, training other folks to do uh, marketing uh, analysis and, and uh, the marketing function uh, to do that. And you, you, you cut yourself off from being able to cross train correctly uh, and to assign training at the right level of granularity to support the operational manager's requirements. So does anybody have any questions? Anybody, anybody have anything they want to put in the chat room or anybody want their uh, mic unmuted so we can, we can talk a little bit before we move on? Okay, well, thank you for uh, 
uh, bearing with me and listening in to what I just had to say there about these different friction points and, and how you can overcome them. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jack. Thank you, Mike. That was a pretty good overview of, uh, you know, what we see out there working with, uh, you know, new customers and customers that are, you know, trying to solve, you know, bigger problems within their organization. I see a couple of new people here have joined. Um, so welcome. Uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to talk about next is uh, uh, the RFP process itself that customers go through and the, the method of acquisition that uh, customers are actually using uh, in uh, buying their technology. Uh, one of the things we see a lot out there is uh, use of these RFP consulting firms. I'm not going to name names of firms. I think you all know who I'm talking about. You know, but these are you know companies that uh, uh, brand themselves as being capable of helping you uh, go through uh, your requirements and come up with a list of potential vendors to send an RFP to. Uh, one of the things that we see out of this is these uh, consulting firms tend to limit competition to a fairly small list of known vendors. Um, and that tends to wrap around whatever criteria, uh, you know, they're using in terms of helping, you know, their clients determine what their needs are. You know, the problem is a lot of these criteria lists are pretty well tied to the vendors that, you know, that they're used to working with. And that tends to, again, limit your competition. It also tends uh, to result in the same vendor or vendors uh, being selected all the time, which you can imagine. Now, a lot of this is because the lists are tired. You know, the requirements lists that the, the consulting uh, firms uh, provide aren't being kept up to date with what the technology and technology capabilities are. And, you know, that's understandable because technology is moving pretty fast. But again, when you start to see, you know, the same, you know, you know, broke record over and over and over again, you start to wonder, you know, what, uh, you know, what the real value is sometimes of these consulting firms. We'll get an RFP in the door and it'll have specifications and standards that there's just no possible way the, the company subscribes to anymore because they're completely obviated by time or technology. And, uh, you know, so these are, you know, things that are, are pretty much, you know, highlights to us that an RFP consulting firm's been used in the, uh, in the, in the process. And so, you know, vendors, you know, tend to write back to the, you know, clients to ask for clarification. You know, do you, you know, are you really going to use this old standard that isn't supported anymore by your organization? Well, you know, obviously the answer is no, and the RFP gets, you know, you know, revised or or corrected or fixed. Uh, but at the same time, you know, having the opportunity to interject things that the client may have missed in their their list that are are fairly obvious based on what the the, the customer does. Uh, tends to be, you know, uh, an, another major issue with uh, using these firms. Now, a lot of times these firms are staffed by people who are ex-learning management system, you know, people at some company and they've left and, uh, you know, uh, they've got very little operational experience, but they know the LMS that they used at their last company. Uh, so we see that, you know, quite a, quite a bit. They're, they tend to be fairly small organizations. Uh, we've worked with a couple. Uh, and uh, they tend to be fairly reluctant to extend their vendor pools to include new features because it's technology they're not familiar with. So again, you know, if you're going to use RFP consulting firm, uh, you know, one rule of thumb here is to, you know, make sure A, they don't have any conflicts of interest and get them, uh, you know, in writing to, you know, confirm that. Uh, and B, if they're, you know, the, the, the things that they're recommending or the, the lists that they're providing you of potential capabilities uh, for technology seem old, let's say they got Adobe Flash in there or something like that, you know, you really probably got the wrong vendor. You, you, you probably need to, you know, look for a, a, a more qualified firm. One way that companies get around this uh, use of these vendors is sending people to these trade shows like the ATD, Association for Talent Development Show, the Training Magazine Show. Uh, there, there's quite a few good shows out there. Uh, and now that the pandemic is starting to slow a little bit, what we're seeing is people actually, you know, going to go to like the Salt Lake City show in September for the ATD promises to be a fairly robust show. And if you go to one of these shows, you know, it's best to create a draft wish list of the things uh, that you want to see. So you're not looking at 
50 or 70 vendors that are offering you things that aren't really on your list of needs that, you know, so have that list in advance, uh, you know, so that you know, uh, you know, what uh, you're looking for and that you can discuss with the potential vendors whether or not they solve any of these wish list problems. Uh, you know, we recommend that companies consider sending operational managers with the people from HR uh, and training to these shows because the operational managers are going to be able to see how it solves their problems. Uh, because again, you know, when you look at the workforce out there, uh, you know, at a large corporation or even a medium corporation, what you, you, you tend to see is that 80% uh, uh, of the personnel, uh, you know, in uh, an organization, uh, you know, are, are not being supported uh, by, you know, the technology that the organization procures. And this is something that a lot of customers would like to be able to change. They'd like to be able to get those field people, the franchise people, uh, you know, the, the, the agents, the, uh, uh, the retailers online with the training programs, more than just for the required training that has to be done every year, more than the, you know, sexual harassment or the, uh, you know, workplace safety or whatever, you know, stuff that HR dictates, but to also be able to use it to support operations, to be able to support, you know, uh, sale of the product uh, that you offer, development of the product that you offer, uh, you know, you, you know, uh, good customer support, uh, you know, services that you provide, et cetera, and get those baked into your wish list to make sure that those needs are actually addressed. Uh, so, you know, developing an expo roadmap to make sure you're able to review the offerings that hold promise for your organization can be pretty, you know, pretty useful. And pretty much all of the major expos will lay out who the vendors are uh, there and what their primary offerings are. And it's well worth your time to just peruse that and check off the ones that you really think you know can can solve some of these problems. Um, one of the things you also want to you know think about is not to eliminate a promising technology that could solve a major organizational issue, whether it be virtual classroom technology, whether it be uh, uh, you know e-learning development tools or or what have you, uh, just because it doesn't fulfill all your requirements. Because a lot of these vendors can work with other vendors. Uh, you know, to give you the whole solution that you're looking for. Uh, you know, the problem is if you just send an RFP out the door uh, after you get back from the trade show uh, to everybody that you think is qualified and you have such a tight time frame on it, it's going to be very difficult for the vendors to say, well, you know, we have this little hole here, but if we worked with this other company, we could, you know, we could really give you the robust solution you're looking for. And so one of the ways that that can get solved is using what's called a request for information process in advance of issuing an RFP. And a request for information is really useful to pre-qualify vendors to make sure that you've got, you know, a stable of vendors that can actually give you the proposal you're looking for, but it also provides the potential vendors with the opportunity to team with other suppliers to provide an optimum solution. Uh, whether everybody knows it or not, a lot of the companies that are providing the training technologies, you know, are, are we, we communicate quite frequently. We talk to each other all the time. We understand what uh, you know the, the strengths of another company is, and those companies market us all the time to add their uh, product, our solution, et cetera, et cetera. But it's very hard to envision how their product might fit into a customer solution if we don't know what the customer needs are. And so, using an RFI to pre-qualify vendors, giving you know companies the opportunity to find. Uh, other, you know, suppliers that can really bolt, bolt up the right product for you without any risk is really the way to go. It's a whole lot better than you having to figure out how to hodgepodge it together at the other end by buying product A and then trying to figure out how to integrate product B and product C and product D into the mix. And these are some of the things that Mike talked about earlier. Now, uh, the RFI should at least provide that consist, concise listing of everything that you want to be able to do, your desired features. It should have, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the full breadth of what you need. But what you really want to avoid in these RFIs is to include features or standards that aren't needed. Uh, and this, again, we see all the time where a customer will put in a, a, a standard that's either not supported anymore by anybody, uh, or they'll they'll add in features that uh, you know are, are are not practical for their their situation, or they don't really understand why they added the feature in to begin with. It's they saw it on a list somewhere, it sounded cool, and so they put it on there. 
uh, you know, and what ends up happening there is now you're in a back and forth with your vendors trying to figure out, well, why did you add that feature? How are you going to use it? Uh, and, uh, you know, how does it apply to your situation? So think through what's in your RFI so it's not just the waterfront of everything that's possible, but the things that you actually need and the things that are going to solve your problems, and you'll end up with a whole lot better response. You also want to avoid using industry buzzwords and proprietary technology names because this tends to cause vendors uh, to think, well, you know, this thing's wired for company A, company B. If you use a proprietary technology name in your RFI that happens to be, you know, uh, a, a trademark of XYZ or happens to be, uh, uh, you know, something that's uh, only available from company Z, uh, you know, it's very hard to get, you know, vendors to respond at that point because they're going to think, you know, why am I wasting my time? They've already decided they're going with proprietary company B. Uh, and the other one that we see out there a lot of times are these buzzwords, okay? And they all sound so great. You know, one of the ones that comes to mind uh, is, is, is Tin Can, okay, neat, nifty name. Uh, and it's in almost every RFP, you know, that comes across the transom. Uh, and then you ask the customer, well, how are you going to implement Tin Can? Uh, you know, have you considered XAPI? Have you looked at, you know, uh, and the buzzword itself, you know, for a vendor that's already decided Tin Can, uh, you know, isn't the way to go and that there's lots better ways to solve that problem tends to cause vendors to say, you know, uh, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't the, the RFP or RFI or procurement for us. Not every vendor is just going to bid, you know, for the sake of bidding. It costs a lot of money, you know, for a vendor to bid. They know they're going to have to do a demonstration. They certainly don't want to get to the demonstration and then not be able to demonstrate something you said you wanted. So trying to avoid that, you know, in your RFI and RFP process can be pretty important. I'll give you a couple examples here uh, of things that we see, uh, you know, in the marketplace. You know, a lot of customers are asking for web conference training technology, uh, and that's it. Yeah, that that's it. A one-liner. They want to be able to do web conference training. Okay, well, you know, you know, Zoom is doing all kinds of uh, you know web conferencing, and a lot of people are using it for training. Uh, and while it's a great you know product for you know web conferencing, as is WebEx, as are a lot of tools. You know, these tools tend to not be training tools, and so. You know, one of the things that we try and work with with customers is to try and think, uh, you know, uh, is it going to solve your requirement? And if your requirement is web conference training and you haven't put any meat on the bones, like engaging the participants, measuring uh, participant comprehension, being able to exercise processes, procedures, analysis skills, meaningful feedback, competitive environments, testing, uh, you know, your participants while they're online to, you know, to sure that they're you know, on track with you, waiting till the end and then giving them a final exam just to find out they failed is really not the way to go with web conferencing training. You've just wasted an hour of everybody's time. Uh, and being able to report that individual progress and performance back to your LMS in, and not just a passed or failed, uh, you know, type of scenario or they attended or they didn't attend it is what we see 90% of the time. But to be able to determine, okay, you know, did they comprehend these points? Did they, you know, uh, you know, demonstrate a skill, uh, you know, uh, a procedural skill that we now are confident that they're going to be able to exercise that in the field? And then the last thing that you know is uh, really bothersome for a lot of customers, and especially the employees that have to sit through them, are the replay events of these web conference trainings because they're videos. There are videos of a talking head and somebody flipping slides and some, you know, you know, some support stuff up there. Uh, and the, the the student themselves never has to uh, and never is asked to become involved in the training. And so the technologies out there today will provide these immersive replays that allow the student to participate, that allow the student to answer questions as an individual, be measured as an individual. I see we've got a couple more people that have here recently joined. Welcome, if I haven't uh, uh, said anything. Uh, but being able to get that immersive replay that gives the on-demand student uh, the same experience or darn close to the same experience as a live student. And the live student wasn't just watching the talking head and slides, uh, but is actually able to engage with the content, answer questions, perform a task, complete a function as an individual or a team in a competitive environment if needed, or in a game environment if needed. These are the kind of technologies that, you know, uh, you know, you can put some meat on the bones if you need web conferencing training. Just an example of something you could put in an RFI. 
a lot of these newer technologies that are out there will leverage interactive learning simulations and gamified comment content in the virtual environment. And so, you know, just because you haven't seen it yet doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Just because the vendor that you brought in to help you with your RFP said web conferencing training uh, doesn't mean that you can't ask for something more. Uh, because your organization can benefit from that, especially in the new environment where we have so many people working from home. And if they're not working from home and they're working from the office, are they able to actually engage with you in the classroom or is it a virtual classroom? And if it's a virtual classroom where your instructors are remote, uh, your, 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 your people that uh, you know, are providing the training are remote, can you engage those students with uh, technology that allows them to actually participate, achieve a grade, get progress uh, track, uh, and if necessary, conduct group competitive exercises, region A against region B, franchise A against franchise B, store one against store 133, et cetera. So these are things you can now do in a virtual environment, and you don't want to leave it out of your process. Now, you know, we're using a, a new training room. This is KMX Live. You're in our conference room technology today. Uh, and one of the things that we like to promote is interactive content, competitive games, simulations, and exams, and the instructor or moderator is what we call ourselves, uh, being able to have a clear view of every student's progress through that element. So if you push an e-learning module to them, you know, to be able to see how they're answering questions, if they're keeping track with their peers, if they're falling behind, if you need to intercede as a moderator and help that person back on track. Uh, or maybe, maybe it's a narrated procedure that the moderator is walking the students through, but the students are physically clicking on things during the process to be able to demonstrate their ability to follow the moderator, instructor guidance. So these are all things that are possible, and uh, it's part of the new training room model that uh, certainly we're trying to promote, and we know a lot of other organizations are trying to promote. Another thing we see out there all the time in the RFP, RFI process is everybody asks for an e-learning authoring tool and technology uh, to be embedded with whatever solution they're buying. Uh, and inevitably, uh, they don't use it. Uh, you know, and we see this time and time and time again with customers that have bought third-party LMS systems, you know, our competitor systems that offer you know, embedded tools that uh, you, 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 know, you get five licenses or 10 licenses you know, for your authors to develop e-learning, and then they go out and buy Articulate or iSpring or Lectora or some other product uh, on top of it. Now, you know, customers need a wide range of people to be able to deploy training to have the kind of breadth that Mike was talking about earlier, to touch your field personnel, to touch your agents, to touch your customers, you know, uh, getting operational SMEs, subject matter experts involved, you know, uh, is really important. So if you've got five licenses for an organization of 10,000 people, probably not going to work out. The problem with some of these third-party tools is they're expensive. They take a long time to learn. Now, there's nothing wrong with them technologically. They work great. Uh, you know, and Articulate certainly is the standard bearer out there in the marketplace. <coughs> But customers, in addition to what they've already got as far as expertise with Articulate and other technologies, should really consider the new cloud-based technologies that are coming along. And again, instead of having authoring tool you know, as part of your RFP or RFI, you know, having some meat on the bones you know, allows the authoring tools to be used by everyone <coughs> within the organization with no additional expense. Being able to leverage you have standard interface control so that they're not hard to learn. So somebody that knows how to use Microsoft Word or PowerPoint, you know, is going to be able to use your new cloud-based authoring tool. The ability to output lessons that are going to work properly on any device, whether it's your cell phone, whether it's your tablet, whether it's your desktop, <coughs> uh, you know, having those kind of meat on the bones is important, as Mike just demonstrated. Uh, you know, but, you know, you, you really don't need to have you know, 10,000 contributors in an organization working with complex tools. So providing tools that, you know, provide the most requested needed features, the things to produce training and simulations <coughs> and testing, <coughs> excuse me, a little frog in my throat, without causing the person developing it to have to spend six months in training themselves trying to learn how to use the product. I don't know how many, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know courses you know, some of these authoring tool providers put on to teach you how to use their product that actually costs, you know, a significant amount of money. You know, there are tools out there in the market that can solve these problems. <coughs> and 
And what you really want to make sure is that you've got a standards compliant or SCORM conformance is, you know, for 99% of the marketplace going to work for record keeping, audits, and progress management. So we blazed through this in about 45 minutes today. <coughs> Excuse me again, got that frog in my throat. And uh, we'll leave it open here for you to, uh, to ask any questions. I do have a survey I'd like to push after uh, we do our summary. Uh, and then I've actually got a set of tools that we're gonna push out to you at the end of the presentation, and we're gonna leave them with you. We're gonna leave the presentation up so that you can access those tools, play with them a little bit. Uh, we'll, we'll stop the recording at that point, uh, obviously, give you a chance to play with the tools individually yourself uh, and uh, uh, move ahead. But before I hit through the summary and discussion uh, points with Mike, uh, is there any comments that anybody would like to throw out there? Um, Mike, AJ, Kira, do you have anything you'd like to add? Frank, I see you're, you're online as well. Okay. Well, no, I'll, th I'll throw one out there. Um, you know, earlier Mike had mentioned, um, you know, customers being conscious of bandwidth, you know, and, and making sure that they understand, uh, you know, what they're delivering, make sure it's mobile friendly, et cetera, et cetera. How concerned should organizations be with overall storage allocation or should that be tied into the metrics that they use to determine their bandwidth capabilities? Mike? There will be a correlation. Uh, if, you, if you're producing a lot of high bandwidth video, you're going to take up more storage. Um, and uh, so your, your you know, uh, production techniques for your content that are bandwidth friendly are also typically storage friendly. Uh, that said, your uh, bandwidth constraints uh, may be much more severe than, your, than you need to worry about with storage. Storage is getting cheaper even faster than bandwidth is. Um, so you need to know your audience and how they're connected to the internet and where they're wor working from. Uh, a classic example of a group that may be constrained, uh, even in the modern internet era with 5G rolling out, we think we're, everybody's getting you know, the fastest, greatest unlimited connections. Uh, imagine training customer service agents that work in a call center. Now imagine that call center has been outsourced and operates overseas in any of the countries that are popular to outsource such a service. Um, they're probably working not from regular Windows laptops, but from virtual terminals. Uh, so there's a, a constraint from the physical device they're working from to their virtual device. Then there's another choke point where all their virtual devices share a common connection to the internet through a, a common host and a common uh, provider. And in fact, they're quite bandwidth constrained. Um, you need to know that what you're producing is going to fit through those pipes uh, and uh, that you're producing in formats that they can consume. Um, some of those types of environments have uh, uh, physical limits on how much per day or how much per hour any one individual agent can consume. Uh, they're implemented with the goal of keeping the agent from uh, spending too much time on, on uh, non-work activities and looking at YouTube videos. Uh, but all of a sudden they get in the way of uh, blocking the same agent from completing his training in a timely manner. Um, so th there is a correlation between storage requirements for your, for your library and the uh, bandwidth requirements for delivering it. Uh, uh, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one and you need to go through that upfront analysis to know where your needs are going to lie and, and on each point and prepare for it accordingly. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, did you have anything you wanted to add before we move on? I didn't have anything to add to that. Okay, good. Okay, so let's go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, you know, there's rapidly evolving technology out there, and a lot of organizations have inherited learning management systems that have been bought by another company, bought by another company, bought by another company, and they end up, you know, eventually folding up to whoever the the last man standing was in that food chain. Uh, and that tends to create a hodgepodge of components and courseware and things that weren't perfectly matched. Uh, you know, it's one thing to have a Mercedes, but to try and replace a Mercedes with BMW parts is a little difficult, okay? And that's what we're looking at here in the learning technology space is so many companies have merged and you know, come forward uh, you know, over, over the years. And uh, if you just go back 10 years, 
uh, you know, in time, which sounds like a long time, but in terms of, you know, uh, learning management, you know, procurement process, uh, for, for a lot of companies, you know, uh, you know, that 10 years, you know, resulted in the company that they originally hired to be their provider for learning technology being bought two or three times over. Uh, and now they're working with yet a third uh, acquiring firm. So that, you know, that can be a problem. The technologies and the tools that are needed to improve employee performance are really readily available, even with some of the setbacks that the industry has had with the loss of Adobe Flash and uh, the loss of ActiveX and uh, Microsoft Streaming Media. There are tools and uh, technologies out there that will solve all the problems that we've talked about today. Certainly, we wouldn't be talking about it if we didn't offer those tools and technologies. But this is more about you know trying to make sure our customers understand how to approach the procurement and the scope of creating a learning strategy for their organization than it is us just trying to tell you, here, our tool fits your box. So what we're encouraging customers to do is use the RFI process uh, and the request for information process that we talked about earlier provides an improved outcome for the customer. And it also gives you and the vendors time to sit back and say, oh, we didn't know that was possible or the vendor in their case, we didn't know that you actually needed that. Okay, so you can have a, 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 an awful lot of collaboration in that RFI process that doesn't take up a lot of your time. Uh, you know, what you're doing is you're giving the vendors the opportunity to solve your problem without having to respond to a proposal of 37, you know, required items of 540 optional items. I mean, that, you know, that, you know, that tends to end up with a bad, you know, uh, result. But if you can give everybody, you know, a little bit of time uh, and plan your process around having the time, uh, you know, to get that feedback, I think you're going to have, you know, a, a better overall outcome. Now, with that said, I would like to push a short survey to you. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here. We're at 51 minutes. Uh, so everything uh, from this point forward is going out on social media, but we're not recording it uh, you know, for the replay version. I'm going to go ahead and send out an end of presentation survey to everybody. And the survey only has two questions. Uh, one, uh, would you like to learn more? Uh, about what we have to offer. Obviously, we're doing this because we would like you to consider, you know, some of the solutions that our company provides. Uh, but at the same time, it also gives you the opportunity to tell us how to improve our presentations or to give us information or comments that would make it so that, uh, uh, you know, you could, you know, you know, decide whether you want to learn more about KMX or any of the products that KMSI has to offer. So only two questions should take you just a minute to answer. I'm going to go ahead and give you those two minutes to uh, to do that. When you're all done with that, there's a toggle display button at the bottom uh, after you submit your answer uh, that you can uh, hit uh, to come back to the room. And then uh, when I see everybody's come back to the room, I will uh, uh, you know move ahead. Okay, well, it looks like we got all the responses we're going to get. I'm going to go ahead and bring everybody back into the room <coughs> that hasn't toggled their way back already. Uh, and before I push out the tools that I promised you that are free and you can download them, uh, they're, they're uh, you know, not, uh, you know, something that, uh, um, you know, is, uh, you know, something you have to pay us for. Uh, and there is a spreadsheet included if you want to use it. And if you need the spreadsheet unlocked, you can write us and let us know that you would like us to unlock that spreadsheet, give you the password, and let you, you know, modify it for your own use. But we put out there lock so that it doesn't show up, you know, uh, with our name on it uh, with something silly in it. Uh, but we will unlock it for a customer that's trying to put together an RFP or an RFI and you want to work with us in that regard. Before I push that out to you, Mike, did you have any uh, parting comments that you'd like to give to our audience? Thank you all for your time today. Uh, we know that uh, you got a lot of choices in how you uh, devote your time and energy, and uh, we appreciate you you spending some of it with us. Hey, do you have any parting comments? You want to add? 
Uh, well, I'll kind of reiterate what Mike said. I appreciate uh, you guys uh, spending some time with us uh, today. And uh, if you'd like to hear some more about some of our tools, we have some more upcoming sessions. And I'll actually be hosting one here uh, July 13th to, to teach a little bit more about our KMX author application. So if you're yeah, interested in point. learning about our e-learning authoring tool, uh, please uh, register for that event here in a few weeks. Great, 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 great. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. That's, that's good. Thank you, AJ. Of course. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and push out the learning and talent management technology tools. At that point, the presentation, when you receive it, will be over. Uh, and uh, uh, you can feel free to leave uh, as soon as uh, as soon as you've uh, you know, gone through and looked at the tools. Uh, Mike and I will be signing off here. And thank you again for attending.